Um, my name is Tim Chase, and for the better part of a decade, I have supported a number of different critical and vital infrastructures, primarily by working in what are called information sharing and analysis centers um, for a number of different kind of sector-specific ISACs and, uh, and ISOs. Um, so this talk is not about what ISACs are, and it's not about specifically what the manufacturing ISAC is, but if you're interested in what ISACs are, what they do, uh, how they kind of work in the overall sort of information security space, I'd love to talk with you about that or manufacturing ISAC if you have any questions uh, about that or any other topic um, after the presentation. Uh, and depending on how quickly I go, there might even be time for q and A if, uh, if you guys have any questions. So a um, couple of things about manufacturing before uh, we get going. Manufacturing is defined like by the United States government and, and some other entities as like an industry vertical. And um, I've worked now sort of for manufacturing ISAC and uh, leading that for two and a half ish years. And um, it's the first industry vertical that's not really a vertical. It's not a vertical. It's actually like a horizontal modality that supports every single industry. It's not discrete like oil and gases or finances or, you know, electrical or something. Um, and so it, it's kind of hard to generalize and because of the size and type of manufacturing, it's also hard to like kind of generalize uh, manufacturing. With that said, we're going to make some generalizations about manufacturing. So um, we're going to start off with the good news about manufacturing. The good news is that manufacturers are really, really good at manufacturing. And I know that goes without saying you're like, well, yeah, it's, it's their business. But I think that all of us could think of like other industries that they're not good at their jobs. Um, but manufacturers are really great at manufacturing. In fact, in human history, large portions of human history are essentially defined by technologies that manufacturers created to be better manufacturers. So the, whether that's use of water as a power source or steam or now electricity or you know now digitization of the manufacturing space, all of those were entirely or largely a result of sort of manufacturers wanting to manufacture more, better, faster, and, and able to do that, they needed to find and harness new technologies. So they're really good at not only embracing new technology, but actually creating technology that didn't exist to facilitate manufacturing. Um, now we, we've moved past the point that, you know, we're using electricity to kind of help automate and we're using you know, digital systems to help automate uh, and increase productivity. But now manufacturing is moving headlong into that kind of cloud-based infrastructure, which is heavily, um, you know, narrow AI and, and machine learning uh, enabled to do a number of different things. Um, I would say that I think about AI in manufacturing kind of the way that I do the internet circa 1993 to 1995. We know a few different things. We know it's going to be a big deal um, and we already have a number of use cases that we're using it for and it's phenomenal and then the third thing is we have enough if we're being honest humility to realize we don't exactly know where it's going to go and how it's actually going to affect what we do but um, so it, there's sort of some similarities there in terms of new transformative technologies so the last thing about manufacturing um, and this is actually a positive i think overall is that manufacturers are their production and profit motivated, right? It's actually what helps them to focus on and get better at the manufacturing process. And what I mean by that is that manufacturers, you know, are businesses and manufacturers think, how do I make as many widgets as possible as fast as possible for the lowest unit cost per widget as possible? And so they make decisions based upon that framework um, and it makes them better manufacturers. Now, with that being said, uh, there are some downsides to that. So the last point about how that framework that they use to, to determine where they're gonna spend resources and what they're gonna prioritize, um, manufacturers are really, really bad at cybersecurity. And the reason is, as it turns out, cybersecurity doesn't make widgets. Um, and so when they're thinking and prioritizing in that framework, I want to make as many widgets as possible, as fast as possible, as low unit cost as possible, the security aspect usually loses out in that discussion. Um, that being said, as we know here, I mean, you're all here at DEF CON, 
there are consequences from chronically under-resourcing security in that process. And I think that a lot of those consequences are sort of coming home to roost for manufacturers, especially as that uh, attack surface is growing exponentially for them. And there's just a lot more badness out there that can touch them. Some of it's not even specifically directed at them. Some of it is specifically directed at them. One of those I would I would say is is ransomware. And there's a few reasons that, that ransomware operators really, really love manufacturers. And and the victimology is is pretty narrow on what they're going after. Number one, uh, manufacturers networks are typically flat and not really well segmented. Uh, number two, they oftentimes utilize sort of enterprise ERP systems that everyone in that like organization, whether they're working in sales in the front office or they're working on the plant floor, have access to to see where manufacturing processes are in line and pull down necessary files you know, for manufacturing process or whatever. That is a giant vulnerability because it requires I obviously IT, you know, and internet access sort of inside of the plant floor, but it's also why a lot of times if there's only IT uh, intrusions in a ransomware, for instance, it could be other things as well, but if you're like me and you read a lot of SEC 8K disclosures, um, they all kind of sound the same, but they only ever reference IT compromise, unauthorized access into IT spaces, but if you read between the lines and you see that there's been operational or manufacturing compromise, you're like, well, how is that possible? If they only got into the IT. Why is your plant down? Why are you not producing furniture or Clorox bleach products or whatever? And the answer is that the reliance on that ERP system, they can't generate orders. They can't pull down the necessary files to load into manufacturing processes. So compromising just an IT system has direct uh, OT effects. And because it's stopping production, even if it's only in the IT environment, um, manufacturers, number one, pay quickly. Number two, um, they're targeting sort of mid-level enterprises, manufacturers where they're large enough to be able to pay a decent sized ransom, but they're not large enough to have really sophisticated sort of enterprise security solutions and the like. Um, so it's this kind of sweet spot that ransomware uh, operators take advantage of uh, routinely. And so for the last two years, especially, uh, we track um, it, our organization and the parent company that we're a part of, the Global Resilience Federation. You can go, I think it'll, the most recent uh, semi-annual ransomware report will be out in about a week. It's free on our website, grf.org. Um, but our analysts, it's, it's pretty time consuming because our analysts have to actually go out and scrape all the tort leak sites about the data on, on the ransomware and the victims. But we collect a lot of data. We've got four years of data. And just a few pieces of data that we collect are, number one, who the ransomware operator was that, that had the victim. Number two, who the victim was. Number three, geographically, at least headquarter wise, where the victim is located. Uh, and number four, what industry that victim is. And so we're able to kind of parse the data and see trends and, and, and the like. Um, and that's how we know ransomware is by far the most targeted industry. I think a lot of different organizations, um, security researchers and the like have said that roughly speaking about between two thirds and three quarters of all ransomware incidents are focused at manufacturers. So they really have a giant target on their back. This is, I think, one of the things that as we'll go and see is actually helpful because they had to learn some of the lessons of the bad decisions they were making to start making uh, good decisions. So um, where do we go from here? So it's, it's a pretty bad place, kind of the security landscape. And I wanna make a caveat here and say that, like I said, we couldn't generalize uh, manufacturers. There are manufacturers that are literally the most sophisticated from a, an operational and cyber perspective down to sort of people that are maybe really large companies, but like are doing almost nothing. So it runs the gambit. But again, we're going to kind of talk about generalities that we that I see. Um, number one is that manufacturing is a little bit different. And I know that I'm speaking on behalf of ICS Village and manufacturing does run a lot of uh, industrial protocols and, and, and the like. But manufacturing is a little bit different in general um, because, well, first, 
in this space, whether it's here at DEF CON or S4 or something, we hear a lot about like IT, OT convergence. And it's been a like sort of buzzword bingo for the last almost 20 years. The thing is that term really doesn't apply to manufacturing for the most part. And the reason is you can't converge something that was never separated. And most manufacturing networks were really never separated in a meaningful like way, either physically or logically. Um, and so that term really doesn't apply. They've also, they're just basically running a network and some of it is used to send emails and, and some of it is used to like on the plant floor. Again, generalizing, sometimes they're really big, but uh, still in general, that's uh, commonly the case. Number two is the networks themselves are becoming less industrial. The last uh, presentation was showing like that uh, converter from uh, a serial connection that was probably like running Modbus to uh, an IP connection. And um, that's very common. So like legacy systems might have one of those dongles that is, is changing from a, a legacy protocol and a serial connection to a more kind of IP centric network. But that's the way that things are going. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some of those are, are mainly having to do with the technology leap sort of into the cloud and AI enablement, meaning that like the speed that things need to flow, the data needs to flow at, and how much data needs to transit that network, you, you're not gonna do that on simple serial networks. Um, so that's, and, and I say like the, the networks are becoming less industrial, not the nodes. At the end of the day, there's still gonna be an industrial process going on, and they might have, at least for that thing, um, some proprietary protocol for the, the process itself, but the network on the plant floor, and it could be multiple locations, multiple production facilities, they're not like kind of older school serial, you know, uh, networks. Um, that is a challenge. Um, it, it makes it easier to build out. And he was also talking about the use of Wi-Fi in industrial applications. That is becoming increasingly common. Um, also, those aren't necessarily the best secured the thinking that they have is like in the same way that people used to think about industrial networks and why they didn't do security in it at all was, well, the network sort of ends at the fence line. So we don't have to worry about securing that inside, but that's not true. We all know that that's not true. Um, okay, so manufacturing is sort of, everyone is focusing now on manufacturing from a, a sales and vendor perspective, solutions providers all of a sudden, my phone rings a lot more from those people that want to discuss manufacturing because they're really sweet on manufacturing. But one of the things we need to like consider because manufacturing is different is that any of those solutions, which they do need them, um, they need to be able to extend to less industrial applications. So we have really, and I'm not going to like name names, but we all can think of them like so telepathy out to everyone. There are really great organizations that have incredible industrial network security tooling, right? Um, and there are really great tools for cloud security, but there's not really something that's kind of going all the way from base metal to AI enabled cloud you know, infrastructure. And so there's, there's seams in that security, even if you implemented all the tools that are currently available. Um, and in, even in that industrial network, the applications and the types of manufacturing that's going on is becoming, I say less industrial, it's, it's essentially moving more towards sort of an IT like landscape where manufacturing devices are sort of just nodes at the end of an IT network, no different than like a printer. You can send it commands, but like it's not, it's, it doesn't look like legacy uh, ICS um, environments. Number two, I, I already mentioned that like it needs to extend up to sort of cloud environments to like seal off some of those security gaps that we have from tooling from an ICS environment or uh, a sort of cloud environment. And then number three, and this is really important, is it needs to extend down to smaller manufacturers. Most manufacturers, there are over 100,000 in the United States alone, are very small organizations, very small organizations. Prior to this, I didn't have enough time to do a site survey and take some pictures uh, for slides and stuff to make it look pretty, but I was gonna go to a manufacturer that um, they make uh, cardboard boxes. And, and some of them were really intricate in terms of like cutting and everything that have m multiple folds and display stands and all that kind of stuff. But they don't have a lot going on from a security perspective. Um, some of that is okay, because some of their systems don't really connect directly uh, to IT networks, uh, but doesn't, yeah. So um, 
it needs these, some of these tools need to be able to go down and scale down, not just up. And then I put in here, don't forget the cyber poor. And, and that kind of goes back to those small manufacturers. Um, most of my members are large organizations. They're, you know, you know, global fortune 500 or even 100 companies. Um, but their supply chains are really small. Um, it gets really small, really, really quickly that are their upstream suppliers. And so, uh, at manufacturing ISAC, we're, we're trying to, we're working currently with, uh, Don Capelli, OT cert to create kind of free training, um, and, and training modules for those organizations completely free of charge, uh, working with some of the larger vendors to bring them in, to get their, their supply chains, to try to reach some of those, uh, organizations that need the help. Some of them don't know they need the help, but, uh, to try to connect them to those resources. So maybe next year I can let you know how that, that endeavor goes. Um, so we've talked about where manufacturing was. They've always been sort of a global leader in, um, technology, not only adoption, but creation of new technology. And, um, they sort of fallen behind in that security. And I think that it's because they haven't understood that that security is actually part of their manufacturing process. It needs to be thought of as part of the process itself. And they, every single business does many, many different things that may not be, as you think about it, you know, discreetly aligned with that business um, and what you do, um, but you still have to do it anyway. You know, you, you have like HR folks and you do payroll. Well, that's not making potato chips if you make potato chips, but it's still an important process nonetheless. Um, so here's why I think that, you know, manufacturers will go from cyber deniers to security high flyers. It's because generally speaking, it's in their DNA to innovate. Um, they just haven't recognized yet that that needs to be a part of what they need to do. And this ultimately is sort of that top line, that executive leadership. When, when, they, when they get the idea that this is something, this is the innovation they need to do to make things work. So if they're looking um, at the new hotness of whatever that cloud infrastructure is gonna help them do to move to the next level, if they understand that a part of that is security and that that security needs to move up and down, um, that buy-in is going to potentially allow them to leapfrog over some other organ, like other industries that, that are like, well, they're currently seen as uh, more security mature in their ICS uh, industrial programs. I actually think that this is basically the core, the heart of the talk. I actually think that manufacturing, while they're doing a terrible job right now. If I come back in a year where currently there are not tools that do all of those things that I just talked about, I think there will be. And I think that the manufacturers themselves will be some of the ones to at least in partnership with new, you know, vendors uh, or on their own will actually create those tools. And then as they mature and utilize those tools in that process long enough where other industries that are in that ICS environment that are thinking about and want to use some of those tools and want to move into a, a cloud environment, they're sort of fence sitters and they're going to wait and watch to see what happens to the manufacturers. Let them be the canaries in the coal mine. And when nothing bad happens, um, you're going to start to see that they're going to adopt that type of technology in the future, I believe. So uh, check back with me on that. So it all starts with the executive leadership. They're the ones that steer the ship. They're the ones that do the resourcing. Um, and they have a couple of things that are, um, are pushing them. Number one is that they're looking at what, what's happening currently inside of the manufacturing space. They're looking at their competitors um, and their vendors and suppliers getting popped every single day, oftentimes with ransomware, sometimes other, but they're, they're being affected. Um, great. And as a result, they have to understand that the crosshairs are on them too. So it kind of focuses their attention. Um, that being said, I think that generally speaking, the meetings that I have with a lot of those executives, my opinion is that most of them are not necessarily thinking correctly about the decisions they've made. They don't actually understand the risk that they're accepting in the business, not doing something. That's, that's changing now. I think they understand. Um, I want to go over there. I'm going over there after this. Um, I think they're, they're understanding now how much risk they're accepting by not doing certain things. So th that's, that's one of the things that's changing. Number two, it doesn't hurt that they're 
are new sort of uh, compliance and regulatory requirements on them that also are focusing their attention. So it's not new, it's new-ish, but uh, SEC requirements that require them to have certain officers in their company that have certain roles um, for information security and cybersecurity. Um, the new CERCIA, is, you know, act is going to uh, change some things too, because now they're going to have to report a lot of the things that they didn't before. And I also see that um, some of the more traditionally cyber mature industries, a lot of that talent is moving to manufacturing. So on most of the calls, 70% of the time, one of those people who's leading that security program, a CISO or someone else, is coming from finance or someplace else that it has a, a more mature process. Um, so the next question is, do I see any change now? Because I'm telling you what I think will happen in the future, but is there anything happening now? Um, the answer is kind of, maybe some glimmers. This is messy data, so don't you don't need to look at the data. The colors are the only thing that matter, really. But I told you about that the ransomware report. So in our semi-annual and annual ransomware report, not the, the weekly ransomware report is more tactical, just a lot more data on the, the victims. The semi-annual and the annual are sort of higher level and talk about trends in that landscape. Uh, and so I had to write my portions uh, for the communities that I lead, including manufacturing. So this is manufacturing. I was just kind of dumping some of the data, and this was whether or not... Um, for each one of those weeks, whether manufacturing was the most targeted sector, okay? So every single week, you know, we got the top sector targeted, right? Um, the, the rightmost column was, when, well, actually, the first four or five columns are like this past six months that I was writing on. But then I was like, well, I should probably look at the previous six months too to kind of do a compare and contrast over, over that time period. So the, the rightmost column is the Q3, Q4 of 2023, and then the uh, other column that's kind of in the center is the first six months, you know, Q1, Q2 of 2024. There's a lot more red in the, the far right hand column, the, the second half of 2023, and a lot less red in the uh, first half of 2024. 40% uh, less times they were the most targeted sector for that week, and a 20% overall reduction in the amount of uh, victims. Now, I think it's too soon to tell whether this is like a real change. I also would note that we saw that they were, um, the, the victims themselves were moving down in organizational size, which means that some of those mid-sized organizations that do have means in order to, um, to improve their situation are doing that and they're becoming not victims. Um, so anyway, there's my glimmers of hope. I've got one minute. And so I don't know if that's long enough for Q and A, but we can try if anyone has a question. I can't see anyone. No questions? A question. How to make cybersecurity sexy for manufacturing. I honestly don't think we can, um, because at the end of the day, they're business. They're they're making decisions based upon business, <clears throat> but I think that we that's a strong enough case for them to 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 do the right thing. I think, but we'll see. Maybe one more, and then then I'll jump down. But we can talk afterwards. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I want to go see what's next door. <laughs> <laughs>